Okay, today I want to talk about knowing God. If you have your Bibles, if you turn to John 17. So my question in the title is, do you know God? I hope that you do. John 17 is Jesus' prayer to the Father. And all of his prayers are to Father. He told us to pray to Father. I'm just going to start at verse 2. It says, you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. A very interesting verse. You know, what is eternal life? Knowing him. Now, Jesus told us in John 14, 6, he said the only way to the Father is through him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So the, the dynamics is clearly here. But what he's saying is eternal life is not a ticket to heaven. Eternal life is a relationship with Father and Jesus by the Spirit. Okay? It's not about just getting your, your ticket punched so you get to go to heaven. It's not about, you know, I'm, I'm glad we get to go to heaven. But, but true eternal life, what Jesus came to give us is restore us to a relationship with Father. Only way it can be done is through the Son. The only way, there's no other way, there's no other religion, there's no other efforts, there's nothing. Only through Jesus. What Jesus did at the cross is the only way that we can be restored to Father. But through Him, we can not only be restored to Father, we can know Him. Now, why this is important is because we live in a day and time when we're flooded with information. The internet, I can go Google people and find out all kinds of stuff. We can read on the magazines and we can hear about our sports heroes or your people in the movies or whatever. You can read so much information that you actually can get to the point where you think you know them. And you know, the reality is you never met them. You never spent five seconds with any of these people. And so you get this, you know, oh, yeah, you know, they do this and they live here and they've got these kids and they go over there and, and this and that. You don't know them. You just know a bunch of information. Boy, I hope that's not the way it is for us going to church. Maybe been raised in church. I've heard a lot of stories. I know those Bible stories. I know all about God. I've heard lots of stories about God. You know, I got a lot of information about God. Question is, do you know him? It's not just knowing about him. It's not about having a bunch of information. It's about, do you really know him? And to know, literally, it literally means to experience. Uh, it's to understand, to perceive. It's not talking about just gaining information. It's talking about a relationship. Uh, it's actually used in the context of Adam knew Eve and she conceived. It's talking about literally a relationship, an intimacy. So the point is, is that what, what he's saying here is eternal life is not a ticket to heaven. It's a relationship that you really do know him. We don't have to go somewhere. We, we can go right now. We can begin to enjoy the relationship that Jesus paid with his life so we could have. And that's what it's all about. So he wants us to have it. So again, you know, you know, do you know him? And is there some way from Scripture that we can sort of tell for sure, do we know him? I think there is. If you'll turn to 1 John. Now again, I'm staying in the, uh, going from the Gospel of John to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, I'm just going to say in 1st John today, uh, this is like the Cliff Notes. Y'all remember Cliff Notes? I, I, if you remember Cliff Notes or not, do they still have those? You know, I lived on Cliff Notes. <laughs> I've never made it to school without Cliff Notes or Monarch Notes or any of those things. I, I knew them well. <laughs> I, I, this is a true story. My goal was to get through high school never reading a book. That was my goal. And I, and I did. Got through all the way through. And what I could, you know, I, I took piano lessons. I took 10 years of classical piano. Can't play a lick. And um, obviously it didn't work too good. <laughs> actually, I know music and I can hear music and I can actually read music. But, uh, but what it did it taught me to memorize I could, we had to do, I had to do performance every year. I had to memorize for a competition 10 songs every fall and 10 songs every spring. 
that I would do in state competition. And so I learned how to memorize. And so I could, I've got through school real well without reading. When God changed my life, he, uh, he made up for all those books I didn't read. <laughs> I read three or four books a month now. I have at least that many books always going at all times. So just so y'all, for the younger people here, don't think that <laughs> you get away with it. <laughs> But anyway, 1 John is sort of the summary version of the Gospel of John. And it's interesting, we're going to start reading in verse 7 of chapter 4. Now, this is beloved. Who's he addressing that to? Okay, are you, are you his beloved? Okay, just want to be sure. So he's talking to us. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who, know, who loves is born of God and knows God. For he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, this is the third time in 1 John that John says basically the same thing. He's saying, okay, here's, here's what he's saying is, eternal life is a relationship with the living God. And that living God is love. If that living God lives in you, then you're supposed to love one another. And so here's the deal. Are you loving one another? Because if you're truly loving one another, then the reality is, is that love lives in you. If you're not loving one another, then what's the problem here? And so that's, the dynamics of that, profound. Again, if love lives in you, the expression of that love should be that we love one another. So if we're not loving one another, are we in relationship with love? Seems like that makes sense to me. Now again, this is not a good suggestion, beloved. Let us love one another for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you, if you do not love, you don't know God. Now it's pretty simple. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Again, God's love has been demonstrated to us. It was, it's been manifest means it's been revealed. It's been where we can actually see it. He sent His only begotten Son that we might live through Him. Now, this is love. Not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that word we don't use a lot, but that is a very important word. It literally means that in the Old Testament, the high priest would go in one time a year with the blood of an innocent animal and would take that blood and go in to make appeasement or atonement into the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat and sprinkle the blood. And they would substitutionary, take their sins and this animal and send it out. So it's called the Day of Atonement. They've just had the Day of Atonement. And every year they did that. So they would hopefully, for one year, that would appease and cover the sins of Israel for one year. Well, Jesus, we're told very clearly, He is the Lamb of God that was slain from the beginning of time. He is not only the Lamb of God, but He's also our High Priest. And in Hebrews, it talks about how He goes into the holy place, not made with hands, but which is in heaven, which are copies of it on earth, but into heaven itself with His own blood. And it says that that sacrifice once and for all settled the whole issue. So what this says is, here's a living demonstration of love, Jesus and what Jesus was sent into the world by Father, and He came in and He died our death and took our pain and our punishment and shed His blood as the complete payment for sin. And what that means is, is that He set us free. Because of what His work at the cross, there's no way that we could appease God, but He did it through literally what he did at the cross. So we have propitiation, propitiation of sins. It means that it's the act of appeasing wrath. And Jesus has done that. Amazing love. 
He loved us when we were still sinners. He went to the cross and died when we were still, you know, we're the ones that were nailing him to the cross. I mean, we're the ones that were, that were doing all the stuff. I mean, he loved us that much. That's love. Okay, it's very important to understand the definition of his love. It's a self-sacrificial. It's a giving when it doesn't deserve. Okay? And then he goes in verse 11, says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Uh, you're going to hear this through John over and over and over and over again. Basically, we're supposed to love one another. That is the expression that he keeps using. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him. If we, he is in us because he's given us his spirit. But the point above that, though, is that again, if, if he's living in us and we're living in him, then it, it's got to be love. It's got to come out. That make sense? If love is in me, love ought to come out of me. If anger is in me, anger is going to come out of me. If hatred is in me, hatred is going to come out of me. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's just, what's in you? What's coming out? And that's really what his whole point is. If love is in you, love should come out of you. If love is not coming out of you, uh, what's the problem? I mean, really, he's just saying that, I mean, wow, this is love. And he moved first. He didn't, we didn't first love him. He, he first loved us. And so love has been perfected in us if we abide in him and he abides in us. Verse 17 says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in this world. Why is that? Well, let me say it this way. Jesus is the express image of the Father. So what you see Jesus walking around on the earth is that you see love living and lived out to the degree that he goes to the cross and dies for us. So the point is, is that as Jesus walked on the earth, we also can do the same thing. Why? If you have eternal life, and you know the Father, He's love. Therefore, just like Jesus, who is the exact representation of the Father, He was filled with love. We also are filled with love too. Now, it's not talking about being perfect and not making a mistake. It's not talking about, oh my gosh, I got to do everything just right. No, it's talking about releasing the love that He has given to us. You cannot give away what you don't have. True? If you wanted a million dollars from me, you couldn't get it. If you cut my hands off, beat me, ran over me, squeezed me, I mean, I don't have it. You couldn't get it. You understand what I'm saying? It's impossible. True. That's true. Can't give away what you don't have. But you can give away what you do have. And if you've got love... Again, if you have eternal life and love lives in you, you can give love away. And you can give away what is needed in this world. That's why he says over and over again, we're to love one another. Love one another. You're supposed to love your, your brother. So we can live that way on earth. And then when time of judgment comes, there's no, there's no judgment because we've been doing the same thing that he did when he was here. We just, we're doing the same thing he did. We're just living like he did and loving one another. There's no fear in love, verse 18. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment or punishment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. Again, it's in context of that other about living your life on earth. But we've talked about this before. If you have fear, worry, anxiety, and you struggle with that, all that is is a flag waving to tell you that you just need a greater revelation of his love. And what we end up doing is we fight fear. We, we rebuke it and we resist it and we do every kind of thing in the world. You know, it's, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But the truth is, is that all that is an indicator. And what we need to really do is to go, wow, I need a revelation of your love. I need a greater revelation of your love. And not just fight fear. 
But if you've got fear, again, if there's a resonant level of fear in your life, you've just not been made perfect in, in his love. And that's really what he, that's all he was trying to say here is that, look, perfect love casts out fear. It just does. When you are, when you're so filled with the love of the Father, there's just literally, when you really know his love, there's, you don't fear. What can man do? What can anybody do? And I listen in this day and time with all the stuff that you hear on the news and all the things going on. I mean, I'm telling you, we need a continual revelation of his love. I love the songs we sing about continually bringing his love and the wave after wave after wave. Uh, I just want to tell you, though, again, very clearly that he loved us first. Verse 19 says we love him because he first loved us. You're waiting for his love. You, you're missing something because he first loved us. Verse 20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother or love his brother also. Now, let me share something with you. I believe that if you'll think about this just a moment, God moved first. He first moved by sending his son to go to the cross and dying for us. Jesus demonstrates the love of Father by going to the cross, taking our pain, our punishment, what was due us, and died our death to pay for the penalty of mankind's sin. God raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand of the Father, dealt with the sin issue, and because of that, we've been restored to Father. Therefore, we can know Him, and if you do know Him, He's love. And so what happens is, is that we, we keep saying I need more of His love. We, earlier this year, we talked about the prayers in Ephesians, and we, uh, especially the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, which is the revelation to pray for His love, that we might know beyond our our intellect, the width, length, and depth, and height of his love, a love that passes knowledge. They would be filled with the fullness of God. That love we should, we should be praying for. But again, understand this. If God lives in you, love lives in you. Now, you want to, how to increase the capacity to get more love? Love one another. Now, I think what's happened is that love lives in us, but because we're, we're unloving, it's stopped up. We're supposed to be a river, and out of our bellies flows rivers of living water. It, well, it's how we love. We love, it keeps moving this way. We love, he's moving this way. You can't outgive God. And what he's trying to get us to understand is you can increase your capacity and your relationship with him as we live it out experientially with one another. So my question to you, so it's not so much today, do you know God? The real question is, are you really loving one another? See, because the, your, that, that is also the fruit of your relationship with Father. So if, if you have a relationship with love, you should be able to release love. Now, why this is important is because, again, you can give away what you do have, and you do have his love. So therefore, you want to know how to, how to increase that love? Start giving away. Start loving people. Loving people without a hook. Loving people without this, if you do this, I'll love you. Or if you're nice to me, I'll do that. Or I need something, so I'm going to love you. Uh, that, that's not the love that Jesus demonstrated. He, he demonstrated a sacrificial loving that gave himself completely. Now look at John, back to the Gospel of John, John chapter 13. John chapter 13, and this is Jesus again talking after he's in the garden there before the, um, he gets to the, going to the cross. And in there, verse 34, it says, New commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You, you think he is going to make a point there? They were supposed to love one another? 
I mean, three times. Now, it's interesting to note, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, uh, well, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't it amazing? He takes 10 commandments and brings them down to two. Now, before he goes to the cross, he's going, guys, I, I, I know two pretty hard for you guys to get. So I'll just do one. How's that? Uh, I'm sure that's not what he meant. But the point is, is that he says, look, a new commandment I give to you is that you would love one another as I have loved you. And that's, that's just cuts out all the stuff. It just puts it down to you want to know how to really live? You want to know how to know God? Love one another. And that's what he's called us to do. Truly love one another. I've spent two months at least in that first John passage. And just, I don't know why God directed me there, but, you know, I think the whole issue is to do, is it me, myself, do I really love people the way that God loves us? And I'll be honest, I'm going, wow, I don't know. You get so busy, you get to doing things, there's so many things that go on in life. You know, are we just running and just going all over the place? Are we taking advantage of situations? Are we really loving one another? I'm just going to tell you, it's, it's, um, do I have a, when I do love or do it, is it because I want something? Do I, do I act a certain way because I'm trying to get something in return? Wow. I'm just telling you, it's, it's like, mm, amazing. Am I really truly loving the way Jesus loved? How did he love? On the cross and died for us. Wow. While we were sinners, I mean, he's on that cross and, you know, he's the word of God. All things were created by him, for him, and through him. Nothing exists that doesn't exist because of him. You do realize that he could have just unexisted everybody all of a sudden. God, that's enough of this stuff. You know, over. But no, he, he went through that for us. A demonstration of love. Do I really love that way? I'll just be honest. No, no. But we can because love lives in me. Now, if love doesn't live in you, we're going to have an altar call in a few minutes, and you need to get born again. But if you're born again, and you say, I'm a, I know I'm a child of God, okay? How is your loving one another? Because that's what he's saying is, don't tell me that you love God, but you don't love one another. Now, I think the greatest manifestation of love is still forgiveness, Jesus on the cross, you know, he goes, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Complete release. Not forgive them if they do this. Forgive them if they won't do it again. Forgive them, whatever. No, Father, forgive them. Completely forgive them. And I think the greatest manifestation of love is us choosing to forgive and to release. And I have people say, well, you don't understand what people have done. You don't understand what I've gone through. I don't. And so I just can't forgive. Wrong. You can forgive. If the forgiver lives in you, you can forgive. Let's just be honest. You choose not to. Here's the other issue. Jesus restored us to a place where we can take responsibility for our lives. You want to give somebody else the responsibility for your life? Hold on forgiveness. They're not hurt. The pain is there when you hold unforgiveness because you're still connected to that person that caused that pain. And if you understand, you've just given somebody else control of your life. Responsibility means when you take responsibility, remember in the garden, they blamed each other. Jesus has restored us so we can take responsibility, which means you have the ability to respond properly. Which means that, you know, doesn't mean somebody didn't hurt you. That's not the issue. Listen, if you're living and breathing on this planet, you're going to get hurt. I mean, that's what people do. People do unbelievable things to each other because of sin. And even believers do that. I'm not talking about a utopia where there's no problems. No, I'm talking about how do we live in this world right now, and we can do so by choosing to forgive. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. 
Now, I just choose to forgive as an obedience to God. Is it easy to do? No. But you can forgive because you can love because the lover lives in you. The source of love, the source of forgiveness lives in you. If you're a child of God, if you're a child of God, don't tell me you can't do that. You can do it. You can give what you have. And he moved first. And we're saying, well, if God will only do this. No, he's already moved. He's waiting on us. You know, it's like they said years ago, I heard somebody tell this about playing checkers with God. He's a gentleman. He moves, you move. As soon as you move, he moves again. He just doesn't move twice in a row. And I'm just being honest with you. He always moves. He, he, he moves immediately waiting for us to respond. And so we can forgive. We can release. We can let people go. And when you do, you know, feelings will come later, but it's a, it's a choice. And we can really release people. But, if, but like I said, don't tell me you love God and hate your brother. Impossible. Because if love lives in you, if a relationship with, with love then it's going to, it should, I say, be released to where we love one another. Amen? And so, one last passage, and that's in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, obviously, you, we, you should know this passage. It's talking about loving your enemies. 5, verse 44. I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute you, who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, four things. And I really believe that not only do we need to do this for our enemies, but we need to do this really for everybody. Number one, it says to love your enemies. Again, what is love? It's forgiveness. It's an active choice to forgive, and to release. And that's really what God is calling us to do. You're going to be offended. He said offenses are going to come. But what we need to learn how to do is to learn how to respond. We have the ability to respond appropriately and to release love. And so we, our love expressed is forgiveness. Second thing we're supposed to do is bless them. Well, what does that mean? It means you bless them. You have the power of life and death in your tongue. We got books out here on how do you bless your children? How do you bless your marriage? How do you bless your mate? How do you bless this? We need to learn how to bless. We need to learn how to quit cursing and we need to learn how to bless. It's easy to recite all the bad things are going on. Why don't we recite, wow, I bless so-and-so with life, health. I bless them with good marriage. I bless them with favor. I bless them with health. I bless them with finances. I bless them with, I just pray blessings over them. Now, they're supposed to do that for your enemy. What, how much more should we be doing that for our loved ones? To learn how to bless and learn how to, how to speak blessings upon them. Next thing it says, do good to them. You can go, wow, now it's really out there. How do you do that? I don't know. But think about this in the morning. If you woke up in the morning and you go, man, today I'm going to get up. I'm going to bless God. I'm going to love people. I'm going to go to work with those people I love. Those that really make me feel so good. And I'm just going to forgive them and bless them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to see how I can do good today and be a blessing to those people I work with or those people I'm around all day long or I go to school with. I'm going to be a blessing. I am going to be, I'm going to be a representative of heaven today. I'm just going to release love everywhere I go. And you may go, you know, you may have the worst day you've ever had uh, <laughs> after trying to do that. The point is, is this. So can you imagine it changes us? It doesn't necessarily change anything else. It changes us. And then the last one is that you pray for them. We need to be doing this. That's just, this is a lifestyle. This is not just every once in a while when there's really a bad problem that happens. This is how we should live. This is how we should be blessing one another. Amen? Okay, we're going to take communion. I've asked Roland to come and, and play as the ushers come to, to uh, prepare for communion. Before they pass out the element, though, what I want us to do, I want us to pray. And I want you to ask God, are you loving the way that you can? Okay? You may say, well, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, you can. If you're born again. If you're not born again, then the Bible says if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved. But again, it's not a ticket. It's a relationship. 
So, ushers, if y'all go ahead and come and just stand in line, stand out here. Don't don't pass the elements just yet. Uh, let me have a chance to pray and all of us to pray, and then we'll pass them out and and take communion here in just a moment. Father, we love you and we bless you and we thank you that you've loved us when we were unlovable. You loved us when we were still sinners. And now you tell us that because of your great love, you want us to love one another. Wow, in the scheme of things, Lord, that's it's your love. It's not even our love. We don't even have the capacity to love. But you live in us. And you said if we really know you, if we've really got eternal life, then we can love. We can forgive. We can bless. Lord, I'm asking this morning that you would help us to really forgive and to really release those from the expectations that we have of what they need to do or how they need to do something before we love them. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to recognize that you've already loved us. That wave after wave that we sing about, Lord, that's your love. You loved us first. You loved us when we were still sinners. Lord, the the cup, the bread we're getting ready to take screams out your love. Amazing love. Forgive me, Lord. about loving the way that you love me. Forgive us all, Lord, for being so self-centered and so self-focused and so self-absorbed that it's all about me instead of it, Lord, being all about you. Thank you that you didn't live that way. Thank you that you came and gave your life sacrificially. Lord, as we even prepare to take your bread in your cup this morning wow it testifies continual testimony of amazing love of the extreme sacrifice that you made for us amazing love amazing amazing love if you're here this morning and you really have a hard time with relationships and people I just ask you to cry to God say Lord I'm going to I'm going to choose this day to forgive I'm going to choose to bless and not curse to do good to pray I'm going to choose today to release the love that you've already released to me Lord, we can't not outgive you. You give and you give and you give and you give and you've given. And you will always give. Because that's who you are. Your love is endless. There is no limitation. Or as the east is from the west, you said you removed our sin. You told us to pray for the, the depth and the height and the length and the width of your love, a love that passes knowledge, to be filled with the fullness of God. Lord, you've already done that. And now, Lord, you've said to us, I want you to extend that love. And Father, I pray this morning that you would help us not walk out of here and just say, wow, that was good, but walk, help us to leave this place today knowing We can love. We can love and we can increase that. There's no shortage on your end. We can know you, not just know about you. Because we can love because you live in us in your love. Lord, we love you. We bless you. And we just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, if you'll pass out the elements, if you'll hold them. And we will take communion here uh, together. As I said, what a 
amazing sacrifice that Jesus did. Amazing love. Every time we take communion, the bread and the cup, what it says to do is do his remembrance of him. And I'm telling you, it says that many of us are sick and weak because we we don't judge the, the body correctly. It's not talking about just judging us. It's talking about not really understanding all that Jesus did for us. Not really understanding the power of how much we need each other and the love that we have. That every time we do this, we're supposed to do this in remembrance of Him. Remembrance is not just thinking, oh yeah, that's right, He did go to the cross. No, it's to have an active and a proactive awareness of all that Jesus did for us. I mean, He paid with His life. That's how much He loved us. Took our sin became a curse, took our sickness, took our shame, died our death. And the penalty for sin, he paid in full. Wow. And then God raised him from the dead to live forevermore. That's our King, our God. Every time this ordinance that God has told us to do, every time we do this is so important, again, to not just go, okay, this is what we do. No, this is powerful, continually connection to the reality of what Jesus has done, who He is, His amazing love for each and every one of us really is amazing, amazing. God loves you. He loves me. He first loved us by going to the cross and dying for us. We did not first love him he's chased us down and what I've just I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we will just begin to release his love and to the people that don't deserve it because he released his love to a people that didn't deserve it either no way 